I'm Derek Sieberson, a senior planner with City of Ashland. Um, I'm here with Tom Humphrey from City of Central Point. Um, Tom, you might just start with a little bit of background. Okay. Well, I uh, was uh, raised in California. I started my planning career after uh, several years in the in the Navy, and um, became interested in planning when I was uh, at San Diego State. And uh, my first, uh, I became established in my my career path in uh, San Joaquin Valley in the Merced County, and. After eight years there, I um, was intrigued by and interested in uh, moving to Oregon. Um, moved to Oregon in uh, 1994 with my family and uh, started working in uh, Roseburg at the Council of Governments. And um, I was there about four years. I uh, did some work in uh, Jackson County, actually in Josephine County, uh, as a collaboration with RV COG. Um, probably in 94 and so I'd had some exposure to um, to Grants Pass and uh, and planning in Southern Oregon but uh, I uh, uh, was on under the impression that that uh, some issues could be somewhat contentious down here but uh, I think I found once I moved that um, uh, they were reconcilable that people could be uh, Kind of rounded up and and um, and uh, not made to cooperate, but I I, I discovered a different uh, atmosphere once I got down here that uh, you know people could collaborate, could work together, could uh, kind of break out of their silos and um, uh, start um, working with one another and um, actually enjoy it. So. Um, I've, uh, I've been here about 21, 22 years, uh, moved down in the uh, early 90, 1998. I, um, I had a couple of advantages in, in arriving in Jackson County. One is I was invited to, to interview for my current, um, well, for the position of planning director because I, I had worked with um, the gentleman who was the city manager when I was in Merced. He and I knew one another from Merced. He um, used me as a reference when he applied for a job as the planning director in Central Point. I was up in Roseburg. Um, the, uh, he was made city manager in, uh, in Central Point after kind of uh, a turnover and some upheaval within the, uh, the city structure. But he, um, he, he thought that he should be a manager full-time and was looking for a planning director. And he and I happened to attend a, a benefits uh, fair together in Ashland. And he asked me if I'd be interested in applying, uh, which I was. And so um, interviewed and, and was selected as the planning director for Central Point. I, I had a um, uh, one uh, employee. Uh, uh, planner and uh, I shared the secretary, I shared a secretary with the city manager and so there was two and a half of us in the department at the time and there was a lot of, uh, a lot of activity in Central Point. There was a lot of uh, growth occurring uh, in the city and um, it was alarming people. Uh, as, as you know, the city surrounded by prime farmland and uh, some of the land had been included in the urban growth boundary uh, from the mid 80s and um, uh, was um, being considered for development. There were a lot of subdivisions that were um, uh, in process. We, um, uh, I, th I think from 1990 to 1995 the city grew, grew by 2100 people so it gives you a sense of the, the dynamics there, we had, uh, when I was working, started working, we had uh, probably 30 building permits a month, which is one a day, and so you can imagine the people who lived in the city for uh, most of their lives, growing up in Central Point, were alarmed by um, the, um, the fact that, that subdivisions were taking over um, fields where um, uh, 
people had been farming and the schools were being impacted. There was, um, well, the city has uh, part of a school district where there are five elementary schools and, um, and two middle schools and, and a high school. And um, they were starting to, re starting to uh, see those impacted. And so the council governments, uh, with the assistance of uh, an economic development um, department of the state, uh, got a grant to do a strategic plan for Central Point. And so in the fall of 1997, just before I arrived, the city launched into a, a process to identify the things that people were pleased about in Central Point, things that they were alarmed with. And, um, and after about four months, they conceived this strategic plan uh, that essentially identified um, four things that people wanted addressed. Uh, now, as planners, you know, we often work with comprehensive plans, which are institutional documents that are required by the state, and uh, that helps us do long-range planning for 20 years. Well, the strategic plan was something that uh, allowed the populace a central point to engage in, identify right away what some of their concerns were and how they thought they should be addressed. And so um, the four things that were identified were, you know, they wanted something uh, uh, done about the growth, they'd like to see it better managed. Um, they wanted to address concerns about transportation because um, uh, Pine Street had become a thoroughfare essentially from um, the freeway to Jacksonville and um, uh, we had a logging operation, mill operation in town and so there were a lot of log trucks um, moving back and forth down the main street. They, they were concerned about there not being enough parks or activities for youth and, um, and because of the activity uh, thoroughfare on the downtown they wanted to see the downtown beautified or revitalized of some, in some way. So these were kind of the broad uh, goals that the uh, uh, citizens identified and when the plan was eventually adopted in 1998 the manager handed it to me as I stepped in the door in, in January and said Tom here's the blueprint um, why don't you see what you can do to make you know meet these goals and, and make some of these things happen uh, which for me was really an advantage because uh, the all the, the background work had been done. Um, people had uh, expressed uh, their opinions about things and, and kind of given us an idea as to what they had expected to see. And um, it was a lot um, simpler um, than trying to um, uh, rehab a, 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 an institutional document like the comprehensive plan. We, we eventually have gone back and and updated chapters of that because um, you know things changed dramatically. So uh, one of the first things we worked on, um, I was able to get s some grant assistance and hire a consultant to come in and, and uh, create a downtown revitalization plan. Um, when I was in San Joaquin Valley, I was on a a chapter committee, uh, the one of the. California chapters of the American Planning Association um, uh, reviewed uh, work for award recognition in, um, in the San Joaquin Valley and, and one of the companies that stood out, one of the awards that I um, uh, you know, considered and, and championed was this, you know, this outfit out of Berkeley, California who'd done some work in Lemoore which was a similarly sized and um, similarly oriented town in California. Um, it was agricultural in nature, uh, about the same size and population, and um, it didn't have a lot going on in its downtown. And so these guys came up and um, helped us create a plan to address you know, the, the goal of city beautification, downtown beautification. And uh, Interestingly enough, we've used that plan, even though it was never formally adopted, uh, the recommendations from that enabled us to acquire property for um, uh, additional downtown parking, identify um, uh, facade improvements uh, for buildings, identify what buildings we ought to make, you know, make an effort to uh, preserve because of their historical significance. 
um, how we how we could improve uh, uh, the downtown in terms of its walkability and and accessibility to pedestrians and, and cyclists. Um, just a, a lot of good information in there. We uh, one of the other things they did is they tried to to create a dimension to the downtown. Pine Street was kind of one dimensional, and by uh, identifying a, a cross axis at the at the center of this little six or eight block core. Um, we created a second dimension, and this cross axis was Third Street, um, which terminated at the south in the historic um, uh, Central Point Elementary had a historic building, which is one of the original turn of the century buildings. Uh, the north terminus of this cross axis was the high school, and um, and they thought that we ought to reorient uh, City Hall to, to Third Street. And, um, and, and we had been talking about um, collaborating with Jackson County and the library and, and creating a city hall that incorporated the county library in it and, and, and reoriented it to third. And, and then the school district, when they were successful passing a bond, um, rebuilt Central Point Elementary and, and uh, turned the historic building into their administrative offices and restored that and so and created a, a performing arts uh, building at the um, the northern terminus on the high school. So they it, it started to having had this plan gave us uh, enough structure to um, collaborate with the county and the and the uh, with the library and co uh, coordinate with the school district and its um, reconstruction of one of the elementary schools. Um, so that plan has been really helpful and it's uh, the, the pieces of the strategic plan um, addressing city beautification um, identified other things that we should work on in order to get to that goal and I can talk about those in a minute after I address some of the other sure. growth related uh, problems. So having that strategic plan and you initially mentioned that you kind of before you came here, heard about how contentious things could be down here, yeah. and the objections to growth that were developing in Central Point. Did having that strategic plan sort of head off some of that contention and get citizen buy-in? Well, it, in Central Point, it, it sure did. And um, you know, part of the part of the things I may have alluded to is that you know, there uh, people were kind of isolating themselves from one another. You know, uh, Medford from. Central Point, from Eagle Point, from Ashland, uh, from the county, and um, and so uh, for Central Point, having the strategic plan did bring together those entities that uh, provided services to Central Point. I think uh, the city appeared to be somewhat forward-thinking when it um, when it dissolved its fire department in in favor of collaborating with Fire District Three uh, to save money. Um, collaborating with Rogue Valley Sanitary Services or Sewer Services um, rather than doing our own work to save money. And we've done other things like that, the county justice system and, and um, uh, uh, I, I can't think of some of the other, I think some kind of water delivery and so forth. Um, those were probably collaborations that ultimately grew out of this strategic planning process because we were we were inviting these groups who we were already contracting with to participate so that probably helped and then uh, once I got to the valley I noticed that um, uh, we did have an effort being made by um, engineers and planners in the county to talk about transportation issues and um, I was familiar with that from Merced because we we were a metropolitan planning organization um, our council of governments uh, managed these um, conversations with um, with different entities to to get federal funding for city and county road improvements and so uh, I I kind of got involved in that that process um, as the city planner and um, and that that be, became a, you know, I guess it was just um, working at building relationships What is what ultimately led to um, uh, improved uh, 
uh, communication and successes with you know, regional planning projects. I think the um, the planning, uh, the transportation planning ultimately uh, that, that was being done in the Rogue Valley was recognized by the state. They created these area commissions on transportation. We were involved in that and, and because we were at the table with the other cities and the county and, and some other agencies when um, issues were being raised about preserving farmland and uh, the concerns expressed by um, uh, you know, local activists, um, uh, uh, agricultural supporters, environmentalists, um, it was kind of natural to move into uh, regional planning with some of the with all the same people that were at the table with transportation. So, um, of course, we got elected officials involved in in um, the regional planning process. But um, yeah, I think it and it and I think being confronted with serious issues, whether they were transportation related or or growth related or or um, land use related um, it forced us to cooperate with each other I don't know I, I, I just I, I began to see how you know you just have to be persistent um, I think people realized there was there was a, a, a common good I mean everybody was interested in themselves obviously but they, they began to realize there was a common good to um, uh, working with one another and um, you know if I can say so I think sometimes the state was viewed as the adversary and we were going to work together to kind of chart our own course um, when we got into the land use arena and we um, kind of piggybacked on um, on a plan that was being done called our region um, we saw that the state had made some effort at recognizing that not all regions of the state of Oregon are created equal. And so when they created regional problem solving in an effort to acknowledge that, um, our, our area took it seriously. And I have to say that, you know, the Rogue Valley is the only entity that really was successful in, in using this regional problem solving um, framework that, that uh, the state created. They, it was tried elsewhere, but after a few years, some of the entities just couldn't or decided not to, to hang with it. We, I guess, were a little more stubborn in the Rogue Valley and decided that, you know, however long this is going to take, we're going to finish it. And um, it took ultimately 12 years, um, which is a long time. But we, we had people who were passionate about it. Uh, they wanted to see it through. Um, uh, they thought that it would ultimately benefit um, all of us and that we'd have a little more uh, autonomy when it came to um, expanding our urban growth boundaries and developing our cities and uh, it also gave us more autonomy as cities to create our own identities uh, without kind of merging with each other. And Central Point shares a, you know, two boundaries with the city of Medford and so it was very easy to just become, you know, a, a, subordinate to Medford um, on the north and Phoenix experienced the same thing on the south. So this, uh, um, and it was consistent with what our strategic plan had kind of set a goal for us to do. Uh, I've, I was, um, we've actually conducted, we're into our third strategic planning process in the city of Central Point. We, we, we had the one in 97, 98. We, we looked at it again in 2007, 2008 which was our 2020 plan. And now that we're in 2020 almost, um, we started into another process um, to take us to 2040. And um, uh, the, the fun thing about these strategic plans is, you know, because we articulated our goals and um, subordinate strategies, uh, you know, I could just take the, the document and, and uh, check off, you know, done, 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 close to being done. And it's really gratifying, you know, you've got a record of, of uh, accomplishments that you knew people really wanted you to work on. Um, 
but that plan uh, was kind of the um, forerunner to a lot of things. It, it, you know, like I say, it was the downtown revitalization. It, it was the um, uh, precursor to the city's involvement with uh, regional planning and managing growth and identifying uh, our kind of unique position in the valley. And it, it gave birth to the city's parks and recreation program, which we didn't have. And so when the people said, we'd like to see uh, more parks, we'd like to see more opportunities for youth and recreation, uh, it started um, uh, quietly and, and uh, it's kind of evolved out of the Public Works Department uh, because that's where the park maintenance was, was occurring. But uh, we brought some people on on a temporary basis and they, the, the parks and recreation program just took off and that seemed to be the the glue that started to hold people together that and and public safety the police department so the the, the police and the parks and recreation program really seemed like it um, it was were the, the, the components that uh, um, started to bind people together and improve the internal communication that we had with uh, our citizens and uh, uh, just as an example, our public works director, once the parks program or the recreation program got off the, off the ground, our, our uh, public works director, who was uh, uh, an outdoorsman, uh, conducted a fly tying class and fly casting class and, um, you know, was right up his alley. And, that, and, and those types of things, you know, you'd, all of a sudden you're getting people volunteering, uh, people coming in and um, Serving the community by, uh, you know, teaching residents um, skills and um, and and it really uh, the parks and recreation program today is just um, um, is vivacious. You know, it's uh, and and it's led to more solid uh, interactions with the um, the exposition and fairgrounds um, because where a lot of events have been occurring out there. The um, uh, you know, downtown celebrations that were always popular, whether it was at Christmas or Fourth of July, have just uh, expanded dramatically. Um, but it just, uh, it's connected people in a way that reinforces what people identified as a small town feel in Central Point. Um, one of the other things that happened as a result of this rapid growth and our commitment to try and do a um, to manage growth or to recognize, you know, the, the ramifications of, of land use development, was um, was the Twin Creeks project. It was uh, intended to be a transit-oriented development or mixed-use development. Um, it was something that, um, well, I, I have to say, if, you know, a lot of our elected officials were brought on the council to address matters of growth. People were that alarmed that not only did they bring it out in a strategic plan, but they they elected people to office who would stop it or slow it down or or fix it, you know, to the degree that I guess they would be more satisfied. And so some of the people who came on as um, councilmen um, uh, didn't want us to approve subdivisions and or annexations. And um, we had made some land use changes in 98 um, that uh, set, set the land up that's just um, west of the high school uh, for, for full-on uh, residential development. Uh, previously it had been zoned industrial and we moved some, some land around. We had industrial land um, there and we had residential land over off of Table Rock Road which really made more sense it, uh, in being industrial, so we made that that exchange. Uh, but the council at the time decided, uh, yes, we've rezoned the property. There's an application in to annex the property, but we don't want to annex it, and we're not obliged to annex it if we don't think it's timely. And, and until we figure out what we're going to do with the schools, um, we don't want to bring that in. Well, coincidentally. The um, the state came down with uh, one of one of its uh, mandates or recommendations to reduce 
vehicle miles traveled and was uh, insisting that the Rogue Valley come up with some mixed-use developments in order to um, to contribute to that reduction, I guess. It, it was somewhat experimental, but it was, a, it was a mandate. And so the Rogue Valley Transit District, or Transportation District, and the Council of Governments um, began a, a, a study to improve public transit by creating these concentrations of of uh, activity uh, that were mixed use. Um, one of ten was the one in Central Point uh, at Twin Creeks. Um, and this was the area that was asking to be annexed, but that the city didn't want to annex. And so uh, I knew that the players involved in that, the developers, contractors involved in that. So I got them involved with uh, on a committee that was part of this uh, group looking at all 10 sites and um, uh, they they began to realize that maybe um, this transit oriented development might be a better option for them uh, certainly you know you, you saw construction of more units as a possibility but it also was um, would have involved more open space and uh, address some of the environmental issues that people were concerned about. And so um, uh, where we had about 200 acres that were identified for single-family detached homes that would have accommodated about 500 with a 10-acre park and uh, a railroad crossing with uh, some commercial in its vicinity, um, the master plan ultimately resulted in the creation of 1,600 units. 50 acres of parks and open space, the open space of which would then put into a land conservancy and a school site and um, and these mixed use, uh, these mixed uses. And so um, it took about, uh, it, it took, uh, well as it turned out, of the 10 sites in the valley, Twin Creeks was one of the top three. And so they did drill down a little bit and, uh, and that's when, um, the, the uh, owners got more interested, and then when the the um, the COG and RVTD concluded their study, that the developer hired the consultant to do a master plan, and it took about 18 months, and it took a lot of money to to pull it all together and, and evaluate, you know, its success, its potential success. Um, the council, having been brought on to uh, quell the growth and manage it uh, were, you know, reluctant. In fact, there was a, a motion made to um, uh, go to a voter-approved annexation to let the, the citizenry of Central Point decide um, uh, whether or not the, the land should be annexed after all this effort was made to um, thoughtfully develop it. Uh, we viewed that as probably more problematic because that wouldn't have meant um, it wouldn't have been isolated to Central uh, to Twin Creeks alone, but it would have been every time somebody wanted to annex, it would have been a, a um, kind of a collective decision. So, so uh, we had included one of the councilmen in our um, planning deliberations over the years, and he he uh, suggested as an alternative um, to this motion that we, uh, we do an extensive survey uh, and get an idea from the citizens to see if they really um, uh, wanted this type of development, if they thought it was an improved, improvement over the others um, in the past. And of 4,000 surveys we sent out, we got about 800, 900 uh, survey response, which is a pretty good um, indication of, uh, of support and, and um, you know, it was a, it was a good, um, it was a good metric for for evaluating this, and so p generally people supported it. And so uh, ultimately, the council bought into it. They adopted a, a pre-annexation development agreement. They they um, uh, insisted that the the project be phased, that certain public improvements be done uh, prior to each phase, in order to com complete the entire project. The other things that were occurring at the same time was a reevaluation of, of um, the elementary school um, 
wards or um, um, uh, student population areas. Um, the school district, um, as I said, had five elementary schools. Two of them were in the county and, and had declining enrollments in Sam's Valley and in Gold Hill. And uh, what we discovered in looking at that more intently is that people, we were busing kids from the county into the school system in town and that was one of the reasons it was being impacted. And so when they redistrict the uh, elementary school boundaries, um, it, it, you know, that created uh, some relief to the overcrowding in the, in the city schools. And, uh, and then we worked with the school district, the city worked with the school district to um, ultimately pass um, a, a new school bond, um, which um, they'd not passed in 20 some odd years and they tried three, three times. The third time was the charm. And, uh, and that did, uh, you know, the redistricting gave some relief to that. The um, uh, proposal for a new school site, if, if needed, in Central, uh, in, uh, in Twin Creeks was, was uh, approved. Um, it just, it's, things started to click, you know, and uh, like I say, every one of our goals could be kind of checked off, um, you know, dealing with managing growth in the city, dealing with managing growth outside the city with our, our partners in the Rogue Valley, um, dealing with transportation issues uh, as they uh, applied to Central Point. Uh, part of this uh, mixed-use development involved a, a railroad crossing, which we had to um, work out with not only the railroad, but Jackson County, local farmers, um, uh, ODOT. We had to take jurisdiction of the entire state highway to, you know, um, put the improvements in that were, were needed in order to get the railroad crossing and actually warrants for the signal. So um, the Parks and Recreation Program was, was um, Blossoming, and um, so those were all those were all really gratifying, you know. But they still, they all still took time. And um, uh, when I was in Roseburg, I lived on a farm, and uh, for four years. And one of the things I, I, I came to appreciate about farming, um, which was one of the many things I was involved in, was that some things just uh, you know it's all about timing. It's all about timing and. Uh, the farmer knows that when he, he, he plants, uh, um, there's a lot of activity around the, the, the planting and, uh, and the preparation, but then you just have to back off and let, let things happen. Uh, there are other instances where when things grow and, uh, and hay needs to be mowed and, and baled and put away um, and, and weather's a factor, then you need to, you need to act more quickly. Um, uh, to take care of that. And so, and I, I don't know, I guess you can make an analogy to, to planting uh, in, in some cases where you just, you need to, you plant the seed, you need to uh, nurture it, and then, then you just need to wait in some cases. And I'm on the receiving end now because after 20 years, I'm starting to see uh, things that, that were conceived 20 years ago uh, come to fruition, uh, not without some heartache uh, or some, um, uh, some argument and, um, and, um, and, and outright fights, um, but uh, ultimately, you know, we're starting to see, uh, see the payoff and, and uh, it reassures the population, you know, once you've, you've checked some of these things off and they know that you're listening, taking them seriously and, uh, and working as, uh, in, in collaboration with them, um, uh, then they're willing to go the next to the next strategic plan and the next to the next uh, um, milepost. So I've said a lot. Um, there are a few other things that are buzzing around in my head. Um, uh, you know, the, the the other mandates we get from the state, uh, you know, have to do lately with um, providing affordable housing and what are we going to do on you know on that score? Well, we think that. This uh, mixed-use development was a, for us, was a step in the right direction um, because it involved integrating different housing types in one geographic area. A lot of times, in city planning, you seem to you tend to isolate the apartments from the single-family detached dwellings from, um, you know, this entire middle. Uh, 
middle area where you've got duplexes and townhouses and, and row houses and so forth. And uh, Twin Creeks has integrated all of those. Um, um, I guess um, because it was a kind of a 15 or 20 year plan and we didn't do the apartments right away, we, we, were, we were, I guess you kind of laugh about it now because you've gotten, gotten through the worst of it, but the people who went in early in single family homes uh, kind of got established and then we started building apartments. They started uh, screaming about, you know, screaming about that only to be reminded that, well, you know, this was part of the plan when we first conceived it. And, uh, so you shouldn't be too surprised. And uh, these guys are making an effort to, to do it the right way. But you begin to see that the value of, of it, the integration because it, um, um, it kind of, everybody's proud of what they have and uh, we've, we've seen people um, you know, take an interest in uh, preserving their property uh, uh, and you know the departments don't you know fall to disrepair they're well managed as are the individual lots and and then we've done these row houses and we've gotten um, uh, retirement facilities incorporated into the mix as well so I mean it uh, every time you introduce something new to a, a population who is accustomed to having things done one way, there's always going to be a little upheaval, and um, we've experienced that on occasion with um, the introduction of affordable housing. We have great partners with the uh, housing authority. Um, you know, some cities uh, are large enough, and and um, um, you know, to have their own staff you know, um, uh, who does uh, kind of the housing side of things. I think that's what you're fortunate enough to have in Ashland. Um, we know in our, on our staff, and I, I've since increased staff from me, the planner, and a half a secretary, and so I've, we ultimately combined planning and building, and, and uh, so there are about seven of us now, but um, even with that many people, um, you know, to have somebody just um, uh, identified exclusively to work on housing is is uh, um, uh, not not always feasible. And so we've worked with the housing authority. They know what they do. They're good at it. And um, we just have to kind of pave the way uh, for them and and um, lobby our council when necessary to, to to support it. And once I found. Um, where a lot of things were met with skepticism early on, um, ultimately the people, once you kind of um, got the critical mass of support and the thing was built, um, and people realized, well, oh, well, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This is better than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and then they say, well, build more of those. Uh, you've got my support now. So a lot of things, you know, my role was just like, kind of convincing enough people that this was going to be a good thing. And then once we had, you know, our uh, democracy at work and, and uh, you know, the, the um, majority voting in favor and, and seeing the construction go up and, and realizing the benefit, then all of a sudden it was, okay, all right, well, we, that turned out better than we thought. And now we have an example that we can point to. And um, if we, our constituents are resisting this development because they have one perception and we can show them different, then uh, um, uh, we're good. You know. And just changing gears a little bit, I, I think my recollection is you take a pretty active role in economic development there too, more so maybe than other planning departments. And haven't you? Um, work quite a bit in recruiting businesses and and retaining and training them to be successful more so than yeah, maybe I, anyone else. Yeah, I appreciate that question. That's um, uh, years ago. Um, well, so as part of the downtown revitalization theme, I, I started to get involved in um, in down, uh, the Oregon Downtown Development Association, at least attend their conferences. And coincidentally, I went one year with uh, John McLaughlin, who was then your planning director, and um, it was up in Hood River, and we 
we uh, sat in together on a, a workshop that was led by a gentleman by the name of John Schallert, who whose um, focus was on helping small businesses become destinations. And uh, we were both impressed. We um, came back to the valley and, and lobbied uh, then um, uh, Medford Urban Renewable, Urban Renewal Development Director Don Burt uh, to go in together with us and, and bring John from Colorado out to the Rogue Valley for three days and talk to our businesses about becoming destinations. What, you know, what singles you out from all the other uh, people who do the same thing you do and, and makes you unique and how do you capitalize on that? And so uh, John was a breath of fresh air and um, the three of us all um, collaborated to bring him here and speak in each of the three towns. Um, and uh, as a consequence, um, uh, people got interested in, in uh, and I remained interested over the years um, in having John come to speak or ultimately he created what was called a, uh, what, what is called a destination business boot camp in Colorado. And so um, I attended one of those boot camps with uh, one of our businessmen and when I attended um, there was a group of uh, people from one city um, in, in the state of Washington who were at the boot camp. And, and when I asked John, you know, what's up with, you know, these seven people that are at this boot camp, they're all from the same town, what, you know, that's part of my community reinvention program. And his logic was, you know, if a uh, community development director or economic development director would bring six business owners to the boot camp, who would all hear the same thing, the logic was they'd go back to their community and they'd, they'd support each other uh, in becoming destinations. And so I, I thought, well, it took me like three years after that to, to assemble six people who were committed to doing the same thing. And, um, uh, and, uh, and I had to keep sweetening the pot because they, uh, you know, I agreed to pay for their registration. Uh, ultimately, I agreed to pay for their travel expenses and with the stipulation that they just had to take time away from work to go to this boot camp. They wouldn't regret it. And, um, and then the, you know, the boot camp had a follow-up, five or, or six month follow-up with homework assignments um, and, and uh, conference calls with John to um, you know, kind of solidify things. And then John would come out and look at each of their businesses and give them um, uh, Kind of suggestions as to how they could make additional improvements consistent with the things he talked about in the boot camp. Well, um, once I got that the group of six, uh, and they they came back all fired up, and they were actually assisting one another uh, to become destinations. Uh, ultimately, one of those business owners wound up on our city council, and I had I had um, I, I didn't beg, borrow, and steal, but I had a line item in my budget that for professional services that. The manager allowed me to use to, you know, sweeten the pot in this case. And um, but once that that first uh, business owner got on the city council, he said, you know, this this thing has has been uh, instrumental in, in making my business more successful. Tom, you need to keep this in, you know, as a budget item, and you need to, you know, you need to perpetuate this thing. So over the years, we've taken over the last 15 or so years, 15, 16 years. We've taken about 30 people to the boot camp, and then, you know, as a consequence, hundreds have have been exposed to John either as a result of these people, these 30 people, or you know, John's commitment to come out and and um, and, and talk more about the idea. So, one of the things that he um, he encourages people to do is to come up with a unique positioning statement. Uh, for their business, which helps them focus um, their business, you know, their their employees, their their customer service, the um, people that they market to, um, all of their efforts kind of revolve around, you know, what is it that makes you unique? And so that's often the hardest part is just coming up with a unique positioning statement. The city, it took me a few years to kind of come up with one. Um, 
for Central Point, but I, I think I finally um, wound up with, with one for the city, and that is uh, uh, we're the most cohesive, people-friendly community in Southern Oregon, guaranteed to surprise you. But that's, that gives you a sense of what, yeah, so that's the first sentence in a u unique positioning statement. And um, I, uh, it took me about 10 years to come up with that. So I'm going to try and perpetuate that idea. Uh, most cohesive, people-friendly community in Southern Oregon, guaranteed to surprise you. And so we hope that's what we're doing. Um, the things that we've done to keep people, uh, to attract other businesses, just, um, and, and, um, and, it, and it's occurring to me that this is probably, uh, somebody asked me this the other day, you know, what, was, what are you most proud of now that you've been in Central Point for so long? And I said, well, you know, I could identify specific developments or plans, but I think what I'm most proud of and gratified by is, um, you know, the this, this sense of creating a, a philosophy or an attitude uh, that's shared by uh, most, if not all, of our employees. Um, the current city manager, you know, started working for the city uh, the year after I did. He was in the engineering department. He's risen to uh, become the city manager. Um, the public works director was a, uh, worked as a temp for me for six months before I brought him on full time, and now he's the public works director. The police uh, police chief, you know, was a patrol officer, uh, has risen through the ranks to become the chief of police, and. And every one of us, and the people that we've gone out and selectively recruited, uh, brought in in the finance department and the building department and um, human resources, all uh, are oriented toward helping people achieve their goals. You know, how can we help you uh, have a better experience in the city of Central Point? Um, often that's at the expense of other surrounding cities. Well, I get, you know, this town or this town, you know, it's so hard to get, you know, permit approved or, or uh, bring a business in or blah, blah, blah. And, and so no disrespect to anybody else. It's just like, this is, um, we want your experience with us to be the best possible one you can have. Uh, we're not perfect. We make mistakes, uh, but we'd like to think we're not as autocratic as some governments can become. And so that's what I'm most gratified by. Is I, I know if I were to retire or leave, that there's a city manager, a public works director, a police chief, human resource director, finance director, building official, who are going to you know, maintain that philosophy of cooperation, and, uh, and that's gratifying. So, uh, we have attracted new business. Um, we, uh, we've attracted Costco, which was a big deal for us. We have an award-winning uh, creamery that's 85 years old, and you know as most people are aware that they've just won an award as the best cheese in the world, um, uh, which which uh, even surprised them and, and delighted them, of course. But you don't want them to leave, and so what do you do to try and you know make sure they stay and and so that's that's part of it is you know it's attracting new business but it's it's making allowances for and helping these other bus existing businesses to think about how they can expand and, and uh, be continue to be successful uh, so we're working with the creamery to make sure they've got a big enough footprint if they after all their uh, um, prestige um, you know decide they want to expand their operation you know want to keep them in Central Point, if at all possible. We have Erickson Air Crane. The Grange Co-op has been a, a great partner over the years. The school district uh, obviously is a large uh, business. But, you know, people in the downtown are starting, with the renovations in the downtown that we finally figured out how to do or finance with the assistance of Don Burt in his retirement, um, uh, just, just re- constructing the downtown and bringing in hardscape and and you know trees which were once there has has uh, gotten people's attention and then we we've uh, made a, uh, a facade improvement program available where the city matches dollar for dollar up to ten thousand for for people to make an investment in the appearance of their building as well as in um, 
the performance of their their uh, business. So we're trying to hit both, and uh, people seem to be pretty enthused at the moment. Um, sometimes that change, you know, the, uh, the winds of change blow, and, and you can't always predict what what's going to happen next. But right now, everybody's pretty enthused about what's going on. I'm always impressed with their work and with the efforts Tom's made. As I mentioned, his efforts at economic development, I think vertical housing tax credits to get mixed-use development. I actually spend a lot of time in Twin Creeks. I had family that live out there and some friends. Um, I'm amazed at what you were talking about with the Parks Department. Um, the mix of different feeling park spaces that are spread out through there to respond not only to that development but to the broader community that you'll go out there and on one night you'll see somebody doing a huge quinceanera celebration. The next night you have the Society for Creative Anachronism sword fighting in the park. Um, and the next <laughs> night is a church group tug having a tug of war right there in the middle of that development. So it's not just their private open space. It's really been integrated so well into that community. And every time I go out there as a planner, I see some different element that I'm sort of amazed got in there. It's just very well done. Yeah, thanks. That's, you know, that's the other things you can't predict, you know, uh, on the land use side. You just try and encourage, I think. Um, well, thanks. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. Thank you. You can perpetuate um, the philosophy if you've got, you continue to recruit good people. And um, so even though the manager and the public works director have been there almost as long as I have. They're, they are younger. They're, they're um, under, our, under this manager, we have we try so many different things. Chris is so um, uh, committed to, to making things better, um, being positive, being uh, forward thinking, um, that uh, it's, just, it's just a fun environment, you know. The, the, the consultant is working with us on our current strategic planning process has said the same thing. It's just, you can just sense the dynamism, you know, and the, the um, enthusiasm of the, and the department has get along and, and we like each other, you know, and, and that's, that can be unique um, in, in and of itself, you know, but you got to work at it. You know, you got to, there's a certain sense of humility that um, I think is, is perpetuated. We're fair. Uh, but we do look for ways to make things happen, uh, you know, within the rules. And I think uh, sometimes with planners or build, building inspectors, you know, if you're a little insecure in, in your ability to make decisions or what the, what the rules really say, um, you know, you don't, you don't take risks. Um, I've got a building inspector who is uh, so well acquainted with the code that when an issue comes up, he says, well, you might not be doing it this way, but here's an alternative that you can use, or he's willing to accept an alternative because he knows what the end goal is. And so, and that happens from the planning department too. It's like, well, what's, you know, what's the spirit of the law and what are we trying to accomplish here? And can we make a concession or do we just change the rules, you know, so that they're more reasonable? And we've done both and, and we're not perfect and we've made mistakes and we're willing to admit our mistakes and, and give refunds on occasion. So, uh, but it, it, so if there, one or two people are doing that, and and it's uh, the you know the, that's the culture, then that that's something that we we hope will be perpetuated. All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure.